Commission. I'm John Steinbrecher and welcome to Conversations with the Commission. Today we're joined by David Saylor, the Director of Athletics at Miami University. David, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Why are you an athletic director? Why are you in this profession? Um, I always knew I wanted to work in sports at some point and starting out as an accounting major I wasn't quite sure how I was going to get there. Um, but when I kind of started talking to people and finding my path, uh, I knew this is what I wanted to do. When I actually worked at Bowling Green for Paul Krebs was when I decided that I wanted to be an athletic director. He's the one that really got me going. What, what is it that, um, I guess, revs your engine about being in intercollegiate athletics? Uh, just the difference you make with the student athletes and the opportunities that you provide and getting to be around such driven kids. It's just really pretty inspiring. and. Um, I've seen it at all levels of Division One, and, and to be at a place like Miami now where I get to work with fabulous kids, it's really awesome. As we take this, we're sitting in downtown Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, you have some uh, ties to some of the teams, professional teams, in this uh, community, which must go back to when you were much younger. Yeah, well, I went to college at Ohio Wesleyan, and while I was there, my parents moved to Cleveland. So uh, I kind of, when I'd come home in the summer, and my first job was Ernst & Young, an accounting firm here based in Cleveland. So that was where I started working in my career. And I became a Browns, Indians, Cavs fan, and I'm blessed to pass that on to my children with all the sorrows that it brings and the challenges that it brings, right, of being a Cleveland sports fan, all the frustrations and, and whatnot. But we enjoy it, and I love being in Ohio. And my parents lived here for out in Seoul and Sugar and Falls area for, for many, many years. So when you were at, you're the director of athletics at the University of South Dakota, and you get a call about, hey, Miami University, we have some interest in that. What went through your head? Well, I had gone to basketball camp at Miami when I was in high school. So I knew the campus, I knew the facilities. Ron Harper was one of my favorite all-time players who, who played at Miami. So the chance to go back and talk to them and interview for the job was really something I knew I had to pursue. And Joel Maturi, who's kind of a mentor of mine, was um, former AD at Miami, and he, he recommended the position with glowing terms as well. Has it, uh, okay, you've been there since, was it 2013, January 2013? Correct. I think I'm correct. Yep. Um, what do you know now that you didn't know then? Um, just how special Miami is to so many people. I'm, I'm amazed wherever I go, fundraising, travel, I get to meet people who talk about Miami, they see the logo, they ask me questions. The difference it makes in their lives is really a pretty special thing and, and I'm blessed to work there. Let's talk about fundraising because we're uh, outside looking in, when I look at you, what, you, what you've done a magnificent job of is in fact fundraising. You've come in and you've, you've energized uh, an institution and a fan base and generated a, a a lot of dollars to, to build a lot of facilities and implement programs, et cetera. Talk to me, how did you get into development um, and uh, what, what, what are the keys to it? Well, when I worked at Rice University as the senior associate, I worked for Chris Del Conte, who is the, the best fundraiser I've ever seen. Uh, he was an amazing individual in terms of how he prioritized what he wanted to do, how he was gonna get it done, and then the work put, put in to, to make it happen. I learned early on that I couldn't be Chris. I had to have my own style. Um, I took what I learned from him and adapted it to who I was and really went after uh, a lot of goals and, and I've been able to have some success with it. But it really is the place I work and the alums and the success they had in showing them the difference they can make at a place like Miami. And that's really what's driven the, the change and all the, the progress we've made. What, what I view as uh, the great accomplishments of you are in and around the area of development. You've come right. in, you've generated a lot of resources uh, and been able to, because of that, build out facilities, uh, invest in programs, et cetera. What is the process? What, what goes into going in and making an ask? Well, when I interviewed for the job at Miami, there were 13 facility projects that were in some form of planning or interest and they sent me all the documents. I went to my interview and I said, you've got too many projects here. You need to focus on getting a couple of them done and then talk about the next couple. But trying to do 13 is just too, too many. 
and I thought I'm either going to lose the job right here or, or, or get the job, and I got the job. And so when I got the job, it was trying to work with the coaches to earn their trust that we're going to prioritize the ones that we need to get done and we think we can get done, and then that's going to build equity to, to do the other ones. And so once we got prioritized what we wanted to do, it was just getting target focused on the donors that could make it happen. And um, just a lot of listening, talking, prioritizing what was important and how I thought we could get there. And fortunately, the donors bought into the vision. And uh, now that we've had some success in getting the projects done, but also with the all sports trophies, now donors are asking what's next. And that's a really cool thing because I feel like we've made a lot of progress to get to the point where we can look to the next set of projects, which is what I told the coaches we'd do when I got to Miami. Let's talk about that. We're six months removed, five months removed from awarding both the men's and women's all sports awards, Miami University. That's a fairly impressive accomplishment. Uh, how does that occur? Yeah, it's the first time we've ever done it in school history in the same year to win both. So it was a pretty special thing for us. And um, it occurred because we, we talk about always working hard as a staff to make sure that we're finishing in the top third in everything we do. Because I feel like if you can do that, then you're going to win your share of championships. The ball's going to bounce right. The puck's going to bounce right. Whatever sport it is you're playing, you know, injuries happen. Schedules are harder than you thought. You know, travel problems, whatever. You might lose a couple things. You might not win every time. Trying to set a goal that you're going to win that every year is, I think, unattainable. But if we can finish in the top third, I felt like we could always be consistently around that that goal of winning those all sport trophies. And the year before, we were second and third. So I felt like we made a lot of progress and, and to have last year work out where it was just nine championships overall for us and seven coaches of the year and the two all sport trophies. It was just really a magical season for us where it all came together. And I have to make sure I tell my board of trustees it isn't always going to be like that. Right. And we have great support from the board and, and great support from President Crawford and his wife Renata. I mean, they come to everything. They are awesome. They know all the student athletes names. The student athletes see them so often they feel really supported and I think that helps in their um, you know, effort to go out every day and give to everything they got. And so I, I feel like we've created a really great family at Miami where we're all in it together, we're all a part of something and I think our kids feel that when they go out and compete. And they tell me that. And so I think that it means a little bit more and I think that that's why we've been able to have some success. How do you interact with your president? Oh gosh, we talked often because he comes to everything. So I see him all the time and uh, we, we talk about how we're building our program and what we need to work on. And he's very focused on how he can help and how he can assist. And so I'm on his cabinet as well. So we, you know, I see him once a week at his staff meeting. And uh, on top of that, just games and everything else. I, I probably talk to him as much as I talk to my wife. This is kind of scary, right? Because I'm always traveling and doing different things. I don't see her as often as I should. but. Um, I talked to, to President Crawford quite a bit. You know, Miami's, I think, by virtually any metric you'd look at, would be considered an elite public university. You're coming off a year where you've had incredible success across the board. Is it possible to, to have, must be possible to have really solid academics, really solid athletics? They don't have to be uh, in conflict with each other. Yeah, one of the lines I used when I got to Miami that my staff loves that I still use all the time is we can have it all at Miami. And I really believe that. Winning and academics are not mutually exclusive of each other. They go hand in hand. We, we get to recruit a different kind of kid and I really enjoy that. I think that's what makes us unique and, and I like being at a school that has that. that it fits my value system very well and what I believe, which is you know education and working with kids that are highly motivated and uh, I get to do that every day. And that's why I tell everybody I'm blessed to work where I do and I'm thankful to work for who I work for and with. It's really a special place. And, and I do think that in the realm of college athletics, you know, Division I athletics needs Miami and schools like Miami much more than we need Division I, to be honest with you. What is it that drives you day in, day out? I'm pretty tenacious. Uh, so a word we use is tenacity in our guiding principles. and. I just love coming in every day, knowing what we have to accomplish and, and going after it. I'm a, one of the reasons I think my staff were successful at fundraising is we say what we're going to do. We say what we want to accomplish. And I believe when you do that in life, people generally want to help you. 
but they have to know what you want to do. And it also makes you, every day wake up, who do I have to call to get this done today? I said what I wanted to do. I said what we wanted to accomplish. I know what we want to make happen. How are we going to do it? And that's an everyday thing. So that drive is there every day to, to live up to the standard we set and the kind of achievements we want to make happen. We got to find a way to do it. So that's really what drives me every day. We're in a very dynamic time in intercollegiate athletics. Maybe it's always dynamic, but the, the array of issues that uh, seem to be coming together are, are quite interesting. And, and one of the biggest right now is the issue of name, image, and likeness, where in essence, we're talking about some level of professionalizing college sports. What do you think about that? I'm a little bit biased on this one because we've got uh, Division One hockey at Miami, and we have seven players in the NHL right now currently playing in the NHL that played at Miami. One left after the freshman year, two left after the sophomore year, and the rest left after their junior, and one, one way till he graduated, and then he went. And so my belief is that these kids, they should be able to go pro whenever they want in any sport they want. And if that's the case, then go earn your name, image, and likeness proceeds and what you can make off of that by going pro. But if you're gonna be in school, at college and serious about what you're doing, then this is how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So I definitely very much believe in the amateur model, um, but I do hope that the NFL and, and the NBA and the professional leagues will just allow kids to go if they wanna go. I don't see why we hold them back. That, who's to say that that freshman at Miami shouldn't have gone to the Winnipeg Jets? You know, he, they thought he was ready, he thought he was ready, he's now playing consistently for the Winnipeg Jets. So obviously it, it worked. Um, now those kids come in drafted, so there's a little bit different situation where it's very open dialogue each year about are you going to go this year or wait another year or wait two more years or three more years. But I think if, if the NCAA can get into some kind of model with, with along the lines of mm -hmm. hockey, I think that would actually be a really good thing for the, sport, for the industry. I just don't know if it's going to be allowed to do that. And with all the states jumping in, it, it just seems very helter-skelter right now. Do you have a favorite sport? I do not. Um, I grew up playing everything, so I really don't have anything in particular that uh, I would lock into as my favorite. So whatever Cleveland team is playing, I'm rooting for them, and when my son's playing hockey, I'm, I'm rooting for hockey and watching hockey. So, from, from the distance of Cleveland to watching Oxford, Ohio, and, and Miami University under your leadership, what I've always viewed you as is this stoic, thoughtful leader. And I've always seen you kind of straight here. You're right here. You're not too high, not too low. <laughs> and so uh, you, you invited me to your uh, uh, opening session with student athletes this year. And I got a chance to see you uh, speak to the student athletes and share a little bit about yourself. And it was kind of emotional. And it, it was uh, clearly uh, you evidenced some passion for the student athletes for your school and stuff, which I don't often get to see. Mm -hmm. um, and it was neat to see. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure inside you're doing the highs and the lows, but I've always seen you right here. Well, it's funny you say that because when I worked for Chris Del Conte at Rice, he came up with a nickname for everybody. He has one for everybody. Well, my nickname was Flatliner. And I used to joke with him that that's not really a good thing. You know, that kind of means that I'm dead, you know. But his point was if the plane's going down, I want David in control because he's not up, down. He's very calm. He's stays focused on what's important. And I've tried to carry that with me. That's definitely more who I am. But I think it's important for the student athletes to get to know me a little bit more. And that's why I try to kind of drop in little parts of my personality. Um, and I thought that at that ceremony we had this year, it was a great chance for me to talk about how important every moment is you have and, and trying to be the best you can be while you're doing it and not get caught up in the things that distract you from that. And, so I think it was a good message, and I think they enjoyed it. Uh, I know they want that kind of welcome back every year, and so we'll see if we can do that. But I also want to relate to the kids, too. I had fun jumping off a platform this week for the swim team, and, you know, and they really enjoyed that. The volleyball team showed up to watch me do it. And so I think just that personality when, you know, it's, I, that's what I love about being at an AD at a MAC school is that we get the chance to interact with our kids, and they know who I am, and I know who they are. And, I talk to other ADs around the country at some of the Power Five schools and they really don't know 
all their student athletes. So they might know who they are generally, but they don't get to talk to them as much. And I, I like that interaction. Is there something or a couple somethings you'd point to as your greatest accomplishment or greatest accomplishments while at Miami? Oh boy. What I talk about all the time with donors is that the entire last five year span, every single semester, our student athlete GPA has been higher than that of the student body. The last five years, our graduation rate for student athletes has been higher than that of the student body. We've won 30 something conference championships since I've been at Miami, and we do 4,800 hours of community service. When you throw all that together per year and see what's happening, that's really what I'm most proud of. And frankly, it's not something that I'm doing, it's what our kids are doing. They're just unbelievable role models, and I'm just thankful and blessed that my two young boys get to watch our student athletes operate, and they get to know them as well. And just unbelievable role models for them growing up. So that's really, I wouldn't say there's any one thing, but when you throw in the $82 million campaign for athletics that we did, I just feel like Miami and Miami Athletics is really checking all the boxes of, of what, what it should, representing a quality MAC institution, right? And I feel like we're, we're living up to that standard, and that's what I'm probably most appreciative of. What keeps you up at night? We're all one phone call away from a, a crazy thing happening, and and responding and dealing with those things. That's probably what keeps me up. I'm, I'm thankful that I live in Oxford because we don't have some of the challenges that other places do, but, and we have such quality kids, but I, I just feel like the industry is probably going in some really weird places that what keeps me up at night right now is what are all the different states gonna come up with you know, legally and how are the federal government gonna get involved and how's Mark Emmert gonna make it all work? That, that's probably what keeps me up the most right now, to be honest with you. If you weren't a director of athletics, what would you be doing? You know, I'd probably try to work for a professional sports team, working towards being a general manager or something along those lines would be what I'd wanna do. That's a pretty lofty goal because those are hard jobs to get. But what I love about college is, college athletics, is that it's the different seasons, the different sports. Uh, working at a pro team, I think probably, I'm guessing, could be pretty monotonous, especially if you're in a tough season, right, and it's long. College, there's always something else on the horizon. You get the new, the freshmen coming in, the new energy. I just love being on a college campus. I think, I think that would be a struggle for me if I tried to work in pro sports. But growing up, it was always working in pro sports. But once I saw the college path, um, laid out in front of me and, and working for Paul at Bowling Green was, was really what changed it all where I said this is what I want to do and so I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what I do otherwise because this is all I want to do. When you're searching for a coach, what, what is the process you go through? I give a funny story this, this past year where we lost Coach Duffy in women's basketball. Um, the coach we wound up hiring, Deanna Hendricks, they played us at Miami. And I was amazed, I was really, not amazed necessarily, but I was really interested in, in the offense they ran. I thought it was really unique and innovative. And so I just kind of made a mental note that I really like what Coach Hendricks is doing with High Point. And I looked at their roster and they had a bunch of kids from Ohio playing down in North Carolina. So I thought, well, she obviously has recruiting contacts. And so I started asking some questions about her, other people, because I just, you just never know when you're gonna need to make that hire. And, um, that worked out where Deanna took the job at Miami and she's now our you know, women's basketball coach. I think she's gonna do fantastic. So I definitely have lists, I'm very observant. I use all my resources of uh, network in, in, in the industry to, to ask questions. And I don't do it when, I'm, when it's kind of like looking like you might have to look for a new coach. I try to do it at just random times and so I'm getting a really honest answer, right? And then they're not wondering why I'm asking or mm -hmm wondering what's going on. I, I try to have really open dialogue with a lot of different athletic directors about staff that are doing a really good job for them, young, young staff. And then I think you have to get some help with a search firm when, it, when you're talking about one of your revenue sports. It's just, you know, just the volume of calls you start getting and the agents trying to track you down, it just gets a little overwhelming. And so I, I feel like a search firm can really assist I was gonna you say, what, do, what does the search firm bring to it other than an initial buffer, but beyond that, how do you have them operate to assist you? 
uh, well, they really help with the confidentiality, especially in the state of Ohio, since we're an open record state, right? So that's a big piece of it. The background checks they can do, the phone calling they can do, the helping with the travel arrangements, um, all those things. I generally have an idea who I want to talk to just because of the research that I do and the, how much I stay up on it. I watch college athletics all the time. So I think my wife thinks I'm crazy, but I just you just never know. So I'm always looking up who's this coach, who's that coach, who's the coordinator, whatever. Um, and so I, I kind of have a general idea, but certainly the search firm might bring a name or two that, that would to get into that mix as well. But um, just, just, and just the agents just wear you out. I mean, it's, it's got to a point where they call and they, I, what are you looking for in a coach? And I just say, just tell me who you're calling about. Because I could tell you what I'm looking for, but you're going to give me the same names anyway, right? So it's just trying to cut through the BS. And I think that's what a search firm can really help you with quite a bit. One of these days, somewhere down the future, when you're retired or you, you've moved on, um, what do you want your legacy to be at Miami University? Um, you know, I haven't really thought about that. It seems so far off. I mean, I, d I just did hit 50, as, as, you, as I talked about it, that welcome back with the student athletes hitting 50 this year. But um, just that I treated everyone like they're part of a family. I think that's what we try to create at Miami, and if I can look back and know that, that I've made a difference to all those student athletes and in our staff too, and, and played a role in hopefully what's one of the most successful periods of Miami athletics, I'll, I'll feel like I really was able to accomplish something. And I think we've started the groundwork for that. There's still more work to do, because for all the all sport trophies you get, there's always another sport that you want to have achieving that success. And, and I want to see it, and in particular, men's basketball and football, we, I really want to see us take that next jump, and I think we're poised to do that. So I'm excited for what the future is going to bring. There's a lot more to do. I'm never going to rest on where we are. I think we can always do better. And um, at the end, I hope that people feel like it was a real productive time in Miami athletics, whatever that period is. That seems like a good place to conclude. David, thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us on Conversations with the Commission.